So in the last chapter of our episode on persuasion, we want to talk about something slightly different. We want to talk about self-persuasion, changing your own attitudes with your own behavior and by utilizing the process of cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance was in the 1960s and a little bit further, one of the most active fields of research in psychology and the most active in social psychology. Tons of variations of the experiments I will show you in a second were done and they really left a mark on um, the popular understanding of what psychology is and I think cognitive dissonance is today part of most anyone's vocabulary. So what is it? Imagine that uh, you meet another student at the first day in induction week and the students are like oh you know what they have this really cool club at city um that i'm trying to get in but you can only get in if you take part in these trials why don't you come along you seem like a nice person would be fun to do it together and you feel like Ugh, what kind of club is it let's say it's a club you're only moderately interested in joining and then you go there and the something similar to what you see here happens okay not quite hazy as we know it from fraternities but I think you have to do something blindfolded I think you have to drink maybe something that's not really fun and you have to endure some embarrassing moments okay and at a certain point in time you wonder why am I doing this okay so let's hold this thought for a moment and go on a different example. Maybe um, on uh, uh, a different day, imagine you're smoking and you're going to a <clears throat> place where to buy cigarettes and you buy cigarettes and you're about to light a cigarettes and there you see these wonderful pictures of cigarettes cause cancer, throat, lung, mouth cancer, um, these vivid depictions. So now you're feeling like, okay, I'm about to smoke a cigarette, but on the other hand, I also believe when it seems to be suggesting that smoking causes cancer. And let's hold that for a second too. And this is basically what we refer to the state that you're in. When a behavior clashes here, we have the behavior smoking cigarettes or being part of this hazing or induction ritual for the a club at university clashes with a belief and attitude. So somehow you feel like, hmm, why am I doing that? Is it really that I, I didn't really want to be part of this club and now I'm doing this slightly embarrassing thing here? Or I don't want to have cancer, but I also do, but I do want to smoke a cigarette. So there's a clash between a belief or an attitude and a behavior. And this is what we call cognitive dissonance. So this is made famous by Leon Festinger, who had like, developed the cognitive dissonance theory and he said this is we experience it as physically as mentally stressful unpleasant so there is something kind of a motivation now to reduce that dissonance so we have basically three ways to reduce this we can change our attitude so we can change our behavior and I mean obviously attitude change is everything we're here about in this chapter on persuasion we can change our behavior we can stop smoking or we can change the action perception we can say oh for instance I only came along to this hazing um, induction here for the club because I was asked by that person Okay, so you have three ways to reduce uh, dissonance. You can change your attitude you can ch or, or your belief. You can change your behavior and you can change the action perception. Often, as we will see, this is not really possible in our life where we and now we have to trade off between changing our attitude or changing our behavior in order to get rid of that nasty dissonance. And what Festinger says is more often than not, what we do is we basically go with the least effort and more often than not changing our attitude is much much easier than changing our behavior so take for instance <clears throat> the example of smoking so you see oh uh, I am 
I smoke, I like smoking, I want to smoke. Oh, smoking also causes cancer. So the dissonance is maybe that you reduce it by saying like, oh, but I really love smoking. Okay, for me, it's so important. If I do not smoke, then this is not really, uh, living is not worthwhile. And it's basically like being dead. Here you increase the um, attitude to such a degree that it outweighs the belief that you might get cancer. Or you might just change the belief. That is something people often and do and I said like you know what my uncle he lived till 93 and he smoked like a chimney in our family we don't um, get a cancer and hence I feel better about my smoking behavior so action perception is often not really changing the action perception is often not really possible because um, w there's little justification to do so. Let me show kind of like how this insufficient justification can be induced in uh, research. And this is like maybe one of the most, maybe the most famous study around um, cognitive dissonance induction and how this changes the attitude. So imagine that this is me uh, and I invited you to an experiment and the experiment is really really boring you see kind of all these packs and i ask you for 40 minutes to turn these packs so from left to right right to left left to right right to uh, right to left you do this for half an hour you're completely bored out of your mind you're like oh my god and then thereafter i ask the following of you could you please go we are really lacking participants nobody surprisingly wants to participate in our experiment could you please go to the next participant and tell them that this is actually a fun uh, participant uh, fun experiment why don't you uh, come and participate as well there's some students standing outside could you go to them and tell them to participate in this study so now there were three different conditions in the first condition i would just have told you that without offering anything in reverse just do it for me um can you please do that the second um is where i offer you one dollar so i don't offer you much but it's like if you tell them that this experiment is fun and that they should participate then um i pay you one dollar so this is in a 1959 so one dollar is a little bit more worth than it is today, but it's still not a lot of money. Or in the third condition, I would offer you 20 pounds. So 20 dollars, sorry, 20 dollars. That's basically today like 80, 90 uh, uh, dollars. So quite a lot of money. It's like, I give you 20 dollars if you go to these participants and lie. And now the interesting bit for us, we're interested in attitudes and attitude change is that after they done that, so after you uh, in these different conditions went to the other students and told them either uh, to participate in this experiment, I will ask you, oh, before you leave, could you just fill out this questionnaire? And one of the questions there is that we are interested in, uh, how much did you like this participant? How much did you like uh, this experiment? How much did you like turning those packs, those boring packs so here are the results sorry uh, for the smear there maybe I can just erase the pen I'm not sure where this is coming from oh this is from okay never mind now I understand um, so here's the condition where you were not uh, told nothing not to lie right and what you can see is here the rating of the task enjoyment is really low you went there you didn't tell them a lie you said like this is a boring experiment but please participate and hence you uh when asked about the enjoyment of the task uh you said Ugh, i didn't enjoy it okay the second one is where i give you 20 pounds to lie to these participants now you can see there's also not much of a difference okay people seem to or participants the condition seem to be like it a little bit more um, but not that much. And then, and this is the most interesting condition, the condition with insufficient justification for the behavior. They respond by, at the end, after lying for one dollar to these students to participate, they say, oh, you know what? I actually really enjoyed the task. So cognitive dissonance explains that by saying that in this condition, what happens is that you don't, you have insufficient justification for your lie. If you like, I lie to these people for one um for one dollar telling them that this experiment is actually fun to participate okay so now i have a behavior and i have a uh, attitude which is like i lied to them because i don't like this 
um, uh, experiment at all. But in order to get rid of the cognitive dissonance, you can just pretend that, you know what, actually, I kind of enjoyed this experiment. It was somewhat, um, you know, um, therapeutical to turn these packs for uh, 30 minutes. So by changing your attitude, you get rid of the cognitive dissonance. If you have sufficient justification, I lied, but I got a lot of money, then you don't need to change your attitude. And also, if you were um, not asked to lie, but you simply, um, oh, you, you didn't do anything in a control condition, right? So if you have insufficient justification for your behavior, then you change your attitude because this is the only thing you can change at that point. So you don't feel bad about yourself lying for one dollar. Now, here's another study that was done that basically kind of mirrors what I described about joining this fictitious um, club at City University. And it's a study by Aarons and Mills. And here they manipulated basically the severity of initiation. This is the title of the study uh, for on uh, uh, to get into the group. So um, there was a group discussion for this group discussion in order to get to be admitted to this group discussion, okay, they, you had to do either something quite um, uh, not innocent, but quite harmless, or you had to do something really embarrassing. And people uh, who did the embarrassing thing, they really liked being in that group and a member of the group uh, uh, very much. So you can see here that there's a reason why there are embarrassing um group rituals to get into certain groups and it is then thereafter you like that group very much you like the group so much more because you kind of have and this is what's often called effort justification you have to justify the effort you have to justify the time you spend um, for joining the group and the easiest way to justify is to tell yourself you know what it seems like I really like being a member of that group. So you change your attitude towards that group, you increase the liking of that group because you do not want to feel your own, um, you don't feel that dissonance. So um, in a very similar study, in an observational study, kind of started that research. This is, um, oh here, you can't really see it by uh, Festinger and colleagues, Stanley Chuck, there was another one. And so Leon Festinger, what he did is he saw that there was an ad, basically, of a prophecy that there will be a flood will be coming a very specific time. So December the 21st, 1954, uh, a flood will be coming will destroy the world, but uh, before that, benign, friendly aliens will come and save us, okay? They will come with their flying saucers and rescue us. And you can join a group and basically join on December the 21st on midnight. This is when they will rescue them. Festinger infiltrated that group and said, like, that's interesting. What happens in the moment when the world doesn't end and the flying saucers do not come? How do people handle us in that group? How do they handle the massive dissonance between their actions or not. So there were some fringe members of the group, people who didn't give much up to be a member of the group. So they didn't have so much cognitive uh, dissonance. But there's some people who basically gave up all their belongings, who quit their jobs, who sold their cars and houses. And now that because they said like, oh, I'm about to leave for a different planet. And then midnight comes and obviously no flood comes. And so what is and no aliens come. And after three or four hours of agony, of silence, somebody's like, oh, how can we explain that? Oh, I think our actions actually signaled to the aliens that we that this planet should be saved and not us that our goodness our dedication to the cause actually saved the planet and so now they called in a press conference they were eager to tell everyone what they had done right there was this massive cognitive dissonance between the what they did and um, the the outcome of it in order to change that they have to change the belief in order to make it fit right in order to make Make it feel like okay this is not something completely stupid so what we often do is even when we are contradicted to a large degree is we rather change our attitudes than our behaviors because changing attitudes is much easier than changing behaviors 
Now, what has that to do with stop waiting for motivation, just start doing? So if you want to self-persuade yourself something, to do something, to like doing something more, to change your attitude, for instance, to studying, to reading, to running, to exercising, the ideas here of the research on cognitive dissonances is that you should basically simply do it, not wait for the attitude to change, not try to change your attitude, but first do it, and then your attitude will follow. So here's like progress. Procrastination is like smoking, right? Um, you will justify it, you will change your beliefs, and you have to stop doing that. You stop uh, changing your attitude towards um, procrastination. Rather, do something if it feels effortful, even the better, because that means that you will change your attitude much more strongly towards it.